82 videos or so up here that, um, and they are sorted into playlists. You can check playlists. And that I believe is all that I, yes, that's all I have. So we're going to, I'm gonna turn it over to Brittany and she'll share her screen while I'm giving a brief introduction. All right. And she, Brittany's coming to us from Audubon of the Western Everglades in Marco Island. And um, she's had a lot of field experience over the past few years since graduating. And um, I'll let her tell us more about that. Welcome, Brittany. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm excited tonight to talk about the burying owls. Uh, more particularly, I'm going to be talking about Florida burying owls, basically in Collier County, uh, specifically more in Marco Island, but also areas of Naples as well. So I'll give a little background about myself. I have kind of a wide variety of experiences. So I am originally from Illinois. I started off knowing that wildlife, anything with animals was my passion. So I became a vet tech uh, right when I was finishing up in high school. And that was the first pursuit that I took going forward. I realized that I loved working with animals in that kind of setting, but I really wanted to get more involved in the field. Um, from there, I actually started working at the zoo at the same time that I was working towards my degree. Uh, so I moved down to Naples. I accepted a full-time job as what's called a prime stock keeper. So it was a mix of primates, postdoc, variety of reptiles, and sometimes other birds were mixed in in the exhibits. So I had a lot of experience working with all of these species together. Uh, from there, I really was inspired by all of the conservation efforts that we talked about and I wanted to be directly in the field, pursuing all of those conservation efforts on my own, especially with animals in the own area that we live near. So I started volunteering with every wildlife group that I possibly could, uh, from Panther Refuge to Big Cypress, Slippery Bay, Frog Watch, uh, a little bit with FWC and Audubon. And from there, I was filling up my resume to basically start applying to as many field jobs as I could. The first position that I accepted was the Florida Fish and Wildlife Seasonal Shorebird position. And I actually worked that shorebird biologist position for three summers. And I worked on the beach with nesting shorebirds, black skimmers, Wilson's plovers, least terns, a variety of other wading bird species were involved with that position. And then from there, because it was a seasonal position, I also jumped to Audubon Western Everglades in the winter and they provided me with a great opportunity of being able to work with the winter shorebirds and all the migratory flocks that come to our area. So it was great to be able to jump back and forth between those positions. And then eventually I was offered a full-time position under Audubon Western Everglades. So I am currently the field biologist and I work in the three different programs that we have. So a little bit of information about Audubon Western Everglades. Uh, we were founded in 1961. We are an independent nonprofit organization and all of our conservation efforts that we do in Southwest Florida are for a variety of species, but we do have three main conservation programs that we do most of our focus on. Uh, those include the winter shorebirds that I talked about, the migratory flocks. We do stewardship and educate the public about allowing these birds to rest and refuel during the winter. Then we have our burying owl program, and that has been going on for about seven years now. We have a lot of volunteers that assist with that program, monitoring the owls and seeing the success of the chicks every year. And then more recently, we have our gopher tortoise program. Uh, that's been going on for about a year now. It really coincides with the burying owls because they're both competing and kind of coexisting with habitat in the same areas of Marco Island. So we're doing a land study on these gopher tortoises and trying to understand more about what struggles they're facing, where they are living, how dense populations they are, and then we're gonna be putting that into a comprehensive plan. We couldn't do all of this work without our over 60 volunteers. Uh, this year, we actually have about 70 volunteers for our Owl Watch program, uh, the Gopher Tourist program. We probably have about five or 10 that are willing to come around into the dense forest with me, uh, but all of these volunteers are a massive help, uh, especially with our shorebird stewardship as well. So to talk about our burying owl program, it does have quite the history. Um, burying owls probably showed up on Marco Island. People were spotting them in near like the 70s and 80s. I, I know that there were reports around that time. FWC was aware that there were burying owls in that area, but there weren't much protections. 
Uh, so when Nancy Ritchie started working at the city, uh, she worked there for about 15 years. And during that time, she started the Owl Prowl program. Uh, she did have a couple of volunteers that started off with her, but essentially she was working in the island and she wanted to protect these owls. So she would start putting up postings, educating everyone about them, and then monitoring them. Uh, from there, she started gaining some more volunteers. Uh, two of those were Jean and Carol. Uh, as Nancy started her own business, uh, she had less time to work nonstop with the owls. Uh, she began re reaching out to these volunteers to assist with the program, and that's when Jean Hall and Carol kind of took over. Uh, at that point, the owls were increasing. Uh, so it went from probably only about a couple pairs in the island to many, many pairs that were growing. And all of these sites, they had to weed whack, and they had to do a maintenance of the postings. They were educating everyone about them. So it became a lot of work. So Jean went up to Audubon Western Everglades and essentially begged them to help with this program. Uh, at that point, uh, he became turned into the Owl Watch program under Audubon Western Everglades. That we were really able to help out by having all these volunteers that are assisting with the program. And then further into it, uh, they were able to get their first biologist to assist with the program, Allie Smith. And she was pursuing a master's and she was banding owls. So the banding of the owls really assisted with understanding their survival, where they're moving, and a lot more about the success of the species on the island. So this, a basic information about burning owls, they are ground-dwelling bird species. There are actually 22 subspecies in North America and South America, but only two subspecies exist in North America. Uh, so we are going to be specifically talking about the Florida burying owls today, uh, but the Western burying owls are also a very unique species. Uh, and we've been speaking with some of the biologists in that area of the United States to learn more about them and try to relate of what struggles they have and how we can help each other out in the research in different areas. Now, looking at these owls, uh, they are very small. So they're only about four and a half ounces. Uh, they're basically the size of your hand. Uh, so when we are banding them, they essentially fit right in the palm of their hand and they're a very tiny bird of prey. Now, looking at the males and females, it is impossible to tell them apart by just looking at them physically. But we do use sometimes some different behaviors that we see during the nesting season to ID which individuals we think are male and female. And then from there, once they're captured and potentially get blood work, then we can confirm. So during the nesting season, typically the male is going to be the one that's going to start digging a burrow and then call in a female. He's going to be the one that's going to be decorating that burrow and trying to attract in a mate. At that time, if he can attract a female and have her stick around, um, that is when, after copulation, the female will lay eggs inside of the burrow. So there comes a point when the female is inside of that burrow incubating the eggs that she turns a very dark color because she hasn't seen the sun in a while, whereas the male is out front guarding that burrow and his coloring of his feathers looks a bit more bleached by the sun. So he'll appear more white when the female starts emerging as soon as those chicks start hatching. Uh, so typically, if there's two owls and then one disappears and then there's one guarding the burrow, in most cases it's male, uh, but it's not always entirely possible to tell. Now, looking at the ages of the burning owls, uh, with Allie's banding in the past, and we're hoping to continue more banding this year, uh, she had discovered that most of the owls on Marco Island weren't really living past five or six years old. Um, we, have, we have a note there that the oldest one was about 10 years old in California, being recited by a band. But it seems like the owls in our area, especially with the urban development increasing, they face a lot of struggles. So their lifespan really isn't all that long. So it really is important to understand that they are a threatened species. Uh, so they do have protections from the state. Uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife in our state, of course, is the main protections that they have. Any development that is going on and our area of Marco Island, almost every property on Marco Island has to have a survey done to check if there are any burying owls or gopher tortoises on that property. And then they have to get a proper permit to remove those burrows and ensure that the owls are out of there before they begin development. Uh, burying owls, it's really important to express to everyone that they do not prevent development, neither do tortoises. But in regards to burying owls, you have to ensure that it is not during a time that they have active nesting going on. So a consultant will scope that burrow and ensure that there's no nesting material, eggs, or chicks before that burrow can be removed. Uh, so aside from that, they do also have the added protections of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, 
Um, although our species, our subspecies in Florida, we do not think that they migrate. Most of them do stick around our area. Uh, we've only had one banded bird that flew to the other coast, but the Western burrowing owls do migrate. Uh, so that gives them a, a little bit more of an added protection. One unique thing about our Florida burrowing owls, which we spoke with the Western subspecies and they have not seen this yet in their area, is we have this unique genetic difference in their eye color. So if you look at the owl on the right, the owl on the right is what you would typically see with a burrowing owl, that bright yellow color in its eye. The owl on the left, we have a variety of differences. So we might see one like this, that it kind of looks like a brown tortoisey color, a little bit of a black. Sometimes they look jet black, sometimes they look mosaic like green, sometimes you'll get yellows in there as well. We get a wide variety. We really think this is just a genetic difference. Uh, we haven't really discovered why uh, it only exists in this area. But going forward, uh, we're trying to do more research on this. One thing that I've had our volunteers do is I'm having them check every single parcel of how many adults have either yellow eyes or the darker eyes and make note of that. And then once they nest and have chicks, then we're able to start tracking the chicks and see how many of those end up having that difference in eye color. Uh, recently, one of our volunteers, Lynn, actually found one owl that is an adult that has one yellow eye and one darker orangish eye. Uh, looks pretty cool. I'll have to include that uh, in the next time I put together this presentation. But our variety of differences in eye colors really make the Florida burrowing owls very unique. So as I mentioned, they do dig burrows. Uh, their burrows can be six to 10 feet long. Uh, so we put postings out on any approved properties that we can get permission to, to ensure that any kind of mowing or any kind of disturbance, we're making sure that that tunnel is kept protected. Uh, the most fragile area of the tunnel obviously is right by the opening where it is the most shallow. As you go deeper, this is a bit more protected, but we wanna make sure that no mowing or anything going on in that area can't eventually erode down that burrow. Now at the end of that burrow is where they will create kind of like a little tunnel area in order to have an area to start bringing in nesting material. And that is where they lay their eggs. Now they can lay about two to 12 eggs. And that is when the female will start incubating them down below. Incubation is about a month. And at that point, once the chicks start emerging, we usually see them at about two to three weeks old. Uh, three weeks old is the most typical time that we see them. Anytime younger, if we see them peek out for a second, a lot of times they're a bit too timid, but it does take them six weeks to fly. So it takes a long time for these owls to be able to have the protection, learn how to go around and feed on themselves. Uh, they look a bit silly as they're going around, running around, trying to figure out what items they can go for and uh, learning from their parents, watching their behaviors. So one really cool thing about the Florida burrowing owls with their burrows is that they actually dig their own burrows. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about decoration, but compared to the Western burrowing owls, Western burrowing owls really use more abandoned burrows than anything. They haven't documented that they dig their own yet, uh, but we did learn after talking with another biologist in South America that the subspecies in her area of Brazil also dig their own burrow. So we thought Florida was super unique. <laughs> they're, they're still pretty special to have be able to they dig their own in the variety of habitats that they do, uh, but it's interesting to know different subspecies uh, have different behaviors in that way. Now, after they do dig that burrow, you'll look at this variety of different decoration that you see. It's really fun to go around this time of year and observe the differences that these owls choose, varieties. Sometimes they'll choose different pieces of colorful trash. Sometimes they'll use more naturalistic items. So they're all very different in their choices, but one thing that we definitely have seen most common amongst them is feces. Uh, feces, anything smelly, and this can be dog feces, this can be tortoise feces, anything that they can find that can have that scent to it. And there's a couple of reasons that we think that they use this. Uh, one being that it's gonna help conceal the scent of their eggs and chicks below the burrow. So it's kind of a protection in that way. And then another reason would be is that it brings food items straight to the burrow. So if you're gonna have feces sitting on the ground, of course, it's gonna attract a variety of insects. Uh, what attracts to insects is gonna be small lizards and frogs. So it's gonna bring food sources right to the burrow. They don't have to hunt. And they also, once their chicks are hatched, the chicks can learn right at their burrow how to hunt on their own right away. 
Now, a lot of these photos are from Jean Hall. Uh, she takes amazing photos out in the field. She is one of the longest volunteers. And of course, I mentioned she was project manager uh, after Nancy Ritchie was leading to her different position. Uh, but all of these photos, it's great to see the variety of items that they eat. And it, it's always interesting to make sure that people understand that they are a bird of prey. Because a lot of times when we tell people that they eat smaller birds, they're shocked by this. But you do remember, they do have talons and they do have the ability to eat a variety of different things. So we see lizards, we see frogs, a lot of insects, smaller birds. We have seen them even go after mockingbirds. I, I physically watched an owl catch a cardinal the other day, which turtles are very fast. So very talented for that owl to get that. Um, but as nesting season starts coming and the chicks are coming, we have set out a game camera, which I, I'm going to have some clips at the end. Hopefully they work out and they're not too slow for you to watch. But we've been tracking how much food they bring in when we think their chicks are hatched. And I've been tracking one burrow site. And at one point they brought in about 60 insects in one night, plus frogs. Uh, it was about four to five frogs and then some lizards as well. So uh, ample amount of food sources. It's, it'll be interesting to track burrow to burrow how much they are feeding and then how many chicks come out at that point. Along with what they are feeding, um, always important to remember that because they are an owl, uh, they have pellets. Uh, and it's always fun for us. We've been doing some classes that we've been having kids dissect pellets. It's a great way for them to be able to see what these owls are directly eating. A lot of the burning owl pellets that we find, the majority of what we see is insects. So if you pick up a burning owl pellet, it kind of just crumbles. Whereas if we're looking at a big owl, like a barred owl, of course, you're going to find a lot more skeletons and bones inside of there. Uh, but this is how they cleanse their digestive tract. It's how they keep themselves healthy. Of course, we're very different. Uh, we're not going to be eating the bones of the animals that we are eating. So compared to them, it's how they're able to eliminate anything that their body cannot digest. All right, I'm going to talk about our 2021 nesting season. Yes, we are currently in our 2022 nesting season, uh, but we don't have those numbers, of course, yet because uh, we are in the peak time of nesting season. But it's really important to look at how big of the numbers are on Marco Island and what we are trying to do to make sure with all the development going on that we can keep those numbers at least stable. So last season, we had 65 volunteers that were monitoring 378 sites. Uh, so 378 sites essentially means that there's a parcel on Marco Island that a burrowing owl dug a burrow on. Whether or not that season there are owls at that burrow, that's what we're trying to discover. So out of those sites, 292 were active, meaning at one point there was an owl at them, whether or not they found a mate, or whether or not they nested from there is what we continue to monitor throughout the season. At those sites, we had 179 pairs of owls, and this is all on Marco Island. Uh, we do have some others that are off in Naples, but this is primarily in our Marco Island area. And they had 158 nests that fledged 471 chicks. Uh, this may sound like a very large number uh, if you're not familiar with the area at all, and it is. It is a decent number, but we have noticed that our numbers are starting to go down, especially because of all the development. Uh, we have lost about 80 to 100 of our sites in the last year due to development, so a lot of our owls are completely misplaced. Uh, we've had owls that are just hanging out in people's front doors and side gardens and kind of lost of where to go. Although there is still some vacant lots, uh, there are available for them to go to. A lot of what we have to realize is that they do have some territories. So although it may look like, oh, there's a vacant lot right next to that pair, they do have some territories and they're not all gonna wanna be in such close proximity to each other. So one thing that we have tried to do, and this was started uh, before I even team worked with this program, but the Safe Harbor program was started to try to give incentives to having people have owls right in their front yard. Uh, so this was created between Florida Fish and Wildlife, the city of Marco Island, and Audubon Western Everglades. So essentially we dig just the start of a burrow in someone's front yard. Uh, it only goes down about six inches, but we create a very nice mound in front of that area. And we also add a tea perch. Uh, we always tell these owners their job is to keep that burrow open until an owl is attracted to it. Uh, we tried a variety of different things of adding light fresh sand. Uh, there was a recent article that was out that was talking about potentially attracting owls by using white paint as kind of a feces attractant that looks like there may have been an owl in that area. 
So we've had owners try a variety of different things. We've also looked at where is the most suitable. These owls are really wanting to have an open area in a yard, so they're not gonna to wanna to be under dense vegetation. But at the same time, uh, we've signed some owls that have definitely gone into areas that we did not expect. Uh, so we do the best we can in trying to figure out what would be the most ideal that we think, uh, but owls are gonna do whatever they think is best. Uh, so we had about 78 starters last season, and out of those, we had 11 that were visited by owls, and then seven of them became fully occupied. One actually was occupied by a gopher tortoise, which is really interesting because we've learned from different studies that gopher tortoises don't usually take to starter burrows. They've tried that in different areas, but gopher tortoises really like to dig their own burrows. Uh, but at the same time, it was great to be able to ride that tortoise at home. Now, so far, uh, this number has even increased since we've been doing this, uh, but we have probably about 130 starter burrows as of now. And as of this current date, we have 15 that have pairs at them, which although if you're looking at the number 130, it sounds like a small number, it's a lot for these owls to adapt to. And we're learning as we go, we're taking measurements and really trying to see what is most suitable for the species. So talking about adaptations, uh, I've always said that this species out of all the different animals that I've worked with are the most adaptable in pretty insane ways that I wouldn't see any other creature do. You know, you're not gonna see a coyote or any other animal living directly next to construction. You're not gonna see them living out in the open in someone's front yard or in a golf course. Uh, that center code who is actually at a golf course in Marco Island, uh, the owners of this golf course, we've been very appreciative. They're, very supportive of the owls. Uh, they let us post up any area that they are. It is a bit scary because we do come and see that golf balls, of course, are flying over and over. This is actually the driving range, so they didn't choose a great area to be, but they have successfully raised their young, and we have yet to find an owl that had any kind of knock in the head or concussion at all. So they're adapting to what they need to in that area. I'm sure they're used to keeping their eyes to the sky, so they're pretty good at managing around. Uh, we do see them use culverts. Uh, recently, I scoped a culvert because we were suspicious that an owl actually did lay eggs in one, and she did. And it was right towards the time that they were about to hatch, and at that time, we got our first rains. Um, so sadly, we don't think that any of those small chicks survived, and this is part of the adapting of, you know, they're thinking that, oh, it looks like a burrow, it might be a good place to be, but they're not understanding all these areas that could flood over time. We do see them dig underneath signs in sidewalks, uh, sometimes underneath rocks and concrete. A lot of that we think is because they're trying to use some source of protection and stability for their burrows. Uh, it gives them more of a, you know, stability that we're not gonna have it collapse. So it's another thing that we come across a lot. So what are the threats? Of course, they face a lot of threats in an urban environment. The biggest threat that they face is car strikes. Uh, they are low flying, they're out at night, they're foraging in the dusk hours. So a lot of times people aren't visibly seeing them. We have increased signs on the island. We've been working with the city to educate everyone about them, to keep your eyes open, to understand where these owls are. At this point, we have burying owls on every inch of the island. So the most important thing that we express to people is to drive slow and to keep your eyes open. Uh, it's a time of night that they're going to be foraging nonstop for food for their chicks. We also do have invasive iguanas that we've been trying to understand their interactions. We have found that some of these iguanas have been burying the burrows of the burrowing owls. We have scoped and tried to find if they're filling in them because they're laying eggs in them. We haven't found any eggs yet. Uh, we've excavated two or three at this point. Uh, so we think it's kind of just in their natural behavior, just like they're digging by seawalls. It's just instinctually when they see a burrow like that, that's how they're going to respond. We have had several sites that have had both iguanas and burrowing owls, and the burrowing owls still fledge their young. So we don't know entirely if they are going after their eggs or chicks. I would not put it past a green iguana to eat an egg if you can get to one. Um, don't you know, know if they would definitely go after a tiny chick as well but that's something that we're trying to do more research and keep an eye out at any sites that we know that we've spotted iguanas. We're trying to have our volunteers monitor, take photos. If we can capture an iguana with an egg in its mouth, uh, that will give us more evidence to try to push the city to have more enforcement on controlling that invasive species. 
Uh, with it, construction, uh, we have a lot of these properties that vehicles are driving onto the vacant lots and parking in that area to work across the street. So that just involves more increased education to the builders, to the contractors, and to any workers that are in the area. Uh, we've had recent meetings with the city to try to increase that we need to provide them educational pamphlets. When we go to the site, we need to point across the street and tell them, this is where the owls are, this is where the boroughs are, please don't park on this property. There is a buffer in our city of Marco Island that they have to uh, obey to make sure that they're not parking too close to these boroughs, but it's constantly something that we're keeping an eye out for. Along with that, sadly, comes a lot of violations. Uh, we've had people intentionally fill in boroughs with rocks. We've had people in two malls. Uh, people don't want to pay to remove a borough before they develop a lot. Uh, it really is not that expensive, and it's something that we're working towards that you can cut that fee in half. Uh, by doing mitigation to do a starter borough in your front yard. So we're trying to educate as much as we can like all around. Now, talking about the decoration, that comes the threat of entanglement. Uh, more recently, about a week ago, with all of the masks that we've been using, we had a burying owl that was reported to us with a mask on it. Uh, myself and volunteers spent about six hours getting this mask off this owl because he was panicking. And at that point, he really wasn't concentrating on going in and out of the burrow and it was not easy to catch him. It was around his neck, so he could still fly, but it was a massive entanglement. Um, we did finally get him, we were able to remove it, but anything like that, uh, trash-wise, we always make sure this time of year to tell people to keep your trash contained, uh, make sure you're not keeping anything outdoors. Along with that, not keeping your, your cats outdoors. Uh, that's one of the biggest threats to them as well. We don't have a lot of feral cats on Marco Island, but we do have some. And of course, work groups are trying to work on controlling those numbers. But house cats uh, are the worst, you know, when they're just going around looking for some trouble as they're going out and exploring the world. And then the top right photo is that of an owl that we've been keeping an eye out for any issues that we have health-wise with this species. So we have had a variety of different eye issues we've seen. This owl actually had to have its eye removed by a rehabber because it had a really bad infection. We saw it at the beginning of nesting season, but when we scoped the burrow, she was on eggs. We didn't want to remove her, so we risked throughout the nesting season to see if she could survive to raise the young. She did totally fine, but the eye was looking worse. So as soon as those chicks could fly and the dad was still present, we took her in, had that eye removed. She was released after about a week and a half. Uh, at that point, she was totally fine, moving around, capable. Uh, anything like that we're keeping an eye out for. Recently, we had an owl that looks like it potentially had avian pox. So we had Florida Fish and Wildlife come and take some samples to test if that's the case or not. Um, obviously, that can be really contagious. So it's something that we want to look into right away. Most importantly, talking about threats to brain owls, this is something that we are really trying to work towards a campaign on, a campaign on Marco Island is stopping the use of rodenticide. Uh, rodenticide is something that a lot of people don't realize all of the side effects of this for a variety of different creatures. Uh, of course, bird of prey are gonna be something that's gonna be affected directly right away. We found burying owls that are laying face first, not able to move. Uh, some of them, if we could bring them in quick enough, they are able to you know, flush them with fluids and get them back to life. But in other cases, we are suspecting that that is the cause of their death. So we're really trying to get fresh samples so we can directly educate people and have proof of this. But in the meantime, we are working towards pushing for alternatives. Uh, the bottom right, you'll see, this is the good nature CO2 trap. Um, I've used a lot of these traps in my days where we're trying to control rats around shorebirds. And these good nature CO2 traps are excellent to use. Uh, they're very effective. And essentially it has a trigger inside of it. The CO2 is what makes that trigger go off really fast, hits that rat right in the head. And then there's absolutely no poison or toxin that's gonna affect any other species. Uh, and this is not just for owls. Uh, recently there was an article in Sanibel that had a bobcat that they believed ingested rodenticide and that a bobcat was bleeding internally very bad and did not survive. So thinking of long-term, please use different alternatives and spread the word. You can use basic snap traps as well. You may want to tie those up and make sure you keep them away from any pets. So our owl club is one of the fun things that we do with an elementary school on Marco Island. And one of our volunteers, Stephanie Parker is a teacher there. 
So every month, these kids get to choose what club they want to be in to have that event every single month. And this group of students wanted to become a part of our Owl Club. So we meet with these 16 kids once a month, and we've done a variety of different educational things with them. We've had them decorate perches. We've had them dissect owl pellets, which they actually wanted to do twice because <laughs> it was so much fun for them to do. We've also had them monitor the owls that exist right at their school, which is pretty cool. Uh, we have a pair of owls that is living within their playground and their basketball court area. And they've adapted to living in that environment. They're very used to the kids. They recently dug a burrow very close to the proximity nearby uh, of a different basketball court. So they kind of go back and forth with whatever ones are less active during probably the school hours when the kids are running around. But this is a great opportunity for us to get involved with citizens and also directly with the children that are going to be influenced by all of these concert if conservation efforts that they can make directly in their own backyards, because a lot of these kids, the majority of them do live on Marco Island. So they're seeing owls constantly in that area. So I have a couple videos and I know they may be slow, but I think they'll be interesting to watch. Uh, this is the game camera that we have on a starter borough. And at the starter borough, we are anticipating that they're going to have chicks soon. So I'm going to try to start it. Uh, and so the owners of this property allowed me to put a game camera there to start monitoring their behaviors. And this is the parcel that I was able to track how many food items that they brought into their borough every night. It's great to see all their interactions with each other watching the neighbors, watching the kids. Uh, they've adapted to this. This family has two younger girls. They're always playing in the front yard and they've completely adapted to these owls being in this area. Go to this next one and you can watch some digging behavior. <laughs> so they're constantly maintaining their burrows. Uh, you'll see a lot of times as they're coming in with food, they're doing that as well. It's constant, constant maintenance to make sure that they keep it open, they keep it ready. And along with that decoration, uh, as soon as their chicks are hatched and they're starting to come out, they'll start kicking off that decoration, kind of clearing it out of the way. Now that their chicks are getting older, uh, it gives them time to have more space and make sure that they can start learning how to feed on their own. So we also got some really cool night shots. Uh, this is on our Facebook of AWE Biology blog. So if it doesn't play very well for you, you can watch it on there. But the male will do most of the hunting. But I have noticed that the female every once in a while will go out on her own as well. So sometimes if he has an item, he'll call her in and have her come over and grab it to go down the burrow. If he calls her and she's not present, sometimes he goes down the burrow by himself and feeds the chicks. Uh, but at this point, he has a big frog underneath his foot that he's going after. So she went and got a small cricket so she could feed the young ones. But weren't ready to eat that big frog, you know, they, they will tear them apart, but it seems like when they're super young, the tiny insects are just the easiest and the best thing to feed them. All right. Well, does anybody have any questions at all? I think there's some in the chat. I have not looked at it yet. Thank you so much, Brittany. That was really interesting. Okay, I'll see if I can field some of those in the chat. Let's see. Um, well, we just have one pertaining to what you're talking about, which is from Delphi. How do they make the burrow with their feet? And I think we just, we saw that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty incredible to see how strong they are. I mean, we've seen them dig in thick turf, uh, sometimes in areas that have rocky, you know, miss into that sand. Uh, of course, they're looking for the easiest fresh sand to dig, but sometimes they have to get past a pretty dense habitat before they can get to the easier stuff. Uh, which is why our starter burrows are kind of a great option for them because we get through the rough area for them <laughs> so it's easier for them to dig you just dig dig that down yes yep we dig only about six inches down uh, we make a nice tunnel for them but we weed whack it first we get it all the way down to the dirt uh, and then we dig a little bit for them and then they take it from there uh, it, it's also good to be able to monitor it that way because you would dig an entire tunnel for them, aside from looking for footprints or any kind of you know, food items, it's hard to see when they actually dug that tunnel. <laughs> and Delcy asked, how long does it take them to create the burrow? 10 feet is a long distance for a small bird. 
we have had owls take burrows overnight. It's pretty crazy. Uh, more recently, sadly, we had a construction site that uh, builders decided to fill in a burrow because they saw that the owls popped up in the site. They didn't want to get a permit to remove it. Um, and so when we uncovered where their burrow was, it was still filled in, but overnight they dug it right back out and dug that tunnel. So they're, they're pretty excellent diggers. I would say the majority of them probably aren't 10 feet. Um, I'd say typically we find them about six feet tall. And they sometimes use to go for tortoise burrows? They do, yes. Um, so we have had a lot of coexisting between the two. Uh, we definitely have had some properties that they are living within the same habitat and then using all the burrows. We do also see them feed from the burrows. So one of my game cameras have captured an owl that every night he would fly to the gopher tortoise lot across the street. He'd sit there in front of the burrow and wait for any either insects or invertebrates to come out. So it's a great feeding place as well. So you were mentioning uh, insects. Well, do they chew them up and regurgitate or just give them to the young whole? Depends on the size, I'd say. Um, so if it's a small insect, they can give it to them whole, but anything larger, you'll see them physically rip up and give them smaller pieces. And parts of the insect come out in the pellets? Yes, yeah, yep. Yeah, you'll see parts of the insects come out in the pellets for sure. A lot of times you'll see, it looks like the tiny wings come out as well. That's why I kind of just, shatters when we pick them up, uh, but we have come across, you know, they'll go for small rodents. Uh, we don't, we don't have, I'd say as many rodents as we do frogs and insects on the island. It's easy pickings for them because with all the lights, that's going to attract all the food that they need in people's houses. And Linda asks, and I think you've already answered, but um, have you made use of artificial burrows? We have not used artificial burrows as in when they are creating the actual tunnel to a box chamber. Um, we haven't needed to. Uh, they have taken our starter burrows pretty well. Um, we do know that they have used them on the other coast. Uh, I do have not spoken with them as to their success with those or not. Um, but as for now, we still have had much success. Uh, recently, I had a, a pair of owls that was in someone's side garden for about a week. Then they reached out to us I dug a starter burrow right next to where they're hanging out in the very next morning. They were both at the burrow and they're getting ready to nest. So we haven't, we haven't needed to, but we've definitely looked into it. And does their burrow get invaded by other animals? Yes. Definitely. I'd say burrow owls are very protective. So they, you know, they're not going to have as many as a gopher tortoise would. Gopher tortoises are allowing up to 300 other 50 species to live inside the burrow, but you will see bees, you'll see insects, you'll see lizards, uh, but they have to realize that that's also their food source. So a lizard may not want to go into a burrowing owl burrow and, and end up being prey, uh, but they we've seen them fight off iguanas and try to kick them away from going inside of their burrows. Um, Gabriella asks, mentions that we notice those black eyes and burn owls from Brazil too. Do you think this might be related to use of pesticides? Oh yeah, Gabriella is who I was referring to with being in Brazil. Thank you for coming. Uh, that's really cool. And we'd love to see those photos. Um, I, we do not know we, from what we know right now, we think it's just a genetic difference, but that would be really interesting to look into. So definitely send us some photos because we haven't seen that in other areas. Does anybody else have any other questions before I get to Joe's question? <laughs> uh, Joe asked, are there any burrows in the Orlando area? And that is a $64 million question. <laughs> I am not uh, familiar with the Orlando area. Um, I, so I am not sure if there are any in that area. Um, the furthest north that I've been for burying all research is up towards uh, Wachula, Florida. So more in the grassland areas, mm -hmm. I'd say, Probably, most likely, most of Disney World has taken over their habitat. Um, so I don't think a lot of the burrowing owls are left in that area. You know, they were typically a grassland species. They probably adapted to coming to Marco Island and found that living in an area where there's nice sandy soil and, and, and upland areas, because we do have some archaeological spots. Uh, so that's something they probably adapted to, but I'm not familiar. Well, there are some on Joe Overstreet Road from time to time, they, they are seen there. Cool. And in Lake County, um, I heard that they there were some near neighborhood lakes. 
um, but increasingly very, very hard to find. Yes, I'm sure. Um, you're having great success in your area with owls. So are any of them ever transported to other areas to start populations, Linda asks. So in Florida, um, Cape Coral is the largest population in Florida and we are the second largest on Marco Island. Um, I think the banding is helping us understand whether or not these owls are moving in between the two. Um, at this point, I think we'd really have to analyze what habitat is left in Florida uh, in order to think about where we would want to at any point if that was a discussion of relocation. Um, but sadly, I think a lot of owls are leaving Marco Island. We are having more show up in Naples. Uh, so at this point, I think they're kind of moving on their own. And so it's really important for us to ban them to track where they end up uh, in their own ways. Some of them may be going to Cape Coral if there ends up being some more habitat up there. How, what percent of them are banded? Have you banded? So Allie banded for, I believe, two or three years. I'd, I'd have to confirm. But she banded about 100 owls uh, in our area. And we have about 20 that are left banded. So we are waiting for our permit to be approved so we can continue banding going forward uh, and track more, especially with these starter burrows, you know, understanding more of if they show up at an area, uh, why do they stay? Why did they leave? Uh, it really helps us understand the success as well because they may adapt to these starter burrows, but they may not nest if they're not comfortable. So it, it really is affecting their populations. Mm -hmm. uh Delcy piped in that um, last time she was able to find the Burton House at Joe Over Street was in 2015. Yeah. Um, Ray asks, what happens if it's raining a lot? Owls love rain. <laughs> it may not always be good for their burrows, but if you ever go out on a rainy day and, and see owls will just spread out their wings, uh, it's their time to take a good bath. You'll see the chicks do it as well. It's really cute to watch them. When we do get massive flooding, that, that is a time that they can lose their eggs and small chicks. It's totally possible. And I'm, I'm sure it happens a lot of Marco that we're always not aware of. Um, more research that was done by Liz White uh, in the grasslands, she's found that there is a higher uh, flooding rate in those areas. So the grasslands, they had constant um, you know, loss uh, in those locations. But it, it's something that we're trying to understand if maybe these owls would ever adapt to trying to nest earlier in our area. Uh, typically they say the nesting season doesn't start till February, but we've had owls in Marco Island that start nesting in November. <laughs> so it's possible, and, you know, it, it can't say, but maybe they are adapting trying to realize that if they beat the rain, they'll have more success. Interesting. And Cindy asked, do they return to the same burrows all year long or just when breeding? So as long as they have a mate uh, from season to season, they will try to nest at that same burrow as long as their same mate is alive. Uh, keeping in mind, you know, five to six years is, seems to be our average. During the off season, uh, when they're not nesting, a lot of times they will uh, still hang out around their burrows. They're not as visible. Uh, so that's a lot of times people think that they disappear during, you know, the fall and winter times. They're still around. Sometimes that's when they end up in people's houses. Uh, it's important to think about the fact that that's when a lot of migratory birds of prey are also coming to our area. So they have to keep an eye out for an increase of hawks. Uh, peregrine falcons are, are great at finding where the burrows are and kind of just stalking those burrows. So it's, it's better to stay in someone's front porch than sit by your burrow. <laughs> Hmm. I think we got all the questions. Anybody else, real quick? Um, this has been, oh, we see a lot of comments. Excellent presentation. Oh, thank you. Um, yes. So, to foster them up here in Central Florida, any just first. First tier tips. To, what did you say, I'm sorry? To foster them, the, if we find population to, to, to build it here in Central Florida. Yeah, I mean, depending of, of course, 
private property. Uh, that, that's that's always our biggest struggle. You know, if we find owls getting permission to post and protect them, but if any of them do show up, uh, if they don't have a burrow already, I I would definitely go for a starter burrow. You know, if you if you own a property that you can. We've been saying that to people in Naples as well. Uh, if people spot an owl in Naples to call us because we can dig a starter burrow immediately and see if they will move in, which in most cases they do. Um, there, there really isn't anything to attract an owl to an area, um, but they're gonna know the habitat that is most suitable for them. Okay. Well, I hope we have the opportunity to do that and increase them and kudos to you all for fostering them down there. Well, thank you. All right, lots of people said they enjoyed it. And uh, you all will see you next week. Brittany, thanks again for, for presenting. Thank you for having me. Have a good night. Have a good night, everybody. <laughs>